tonight. Really excited to welcome Kerry Sharp, head of the Scottish Investment Bank. Um, I'll, I'll do your intro in your bio, um, not to steal your thunder. <laughs> Um, just a couple of stats that were quite exciting. Um, the Scottish Investment Bank has over 280 portfolio countries, uh, companies um, valued at over 220 million, which I thought was pretty impressive. Um, Kerry's own backgrounds in corporate finance and venture capital started out with the Bank of Scotland and 3i before joining SE in 2006. Initially joined to manage one of the co-investment funds and then established and managed the Scottish Investment Bank investment management function before taking over as head of the Scottish Investment Bank in 2013. So welcome to Kerry. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me and thanks for coming out. I know it's a lovely night tonight, so I'm sure you'll probably be rather at home with a glass of Prosecco. So thanks for coming <laughs> in to, to listen to this. Um, so just to start off, um, Kerry, can you talk us through a bit of your own journey? How did you get to where you are today and, and what you do? Okay, so um, I, I studied accountancy at university, um, which um, made me realise I didn't want to be an accountant really pretty much after that. Um, and I joined Banking Bank of Scotland, as you mentioned. Um, so I went through the graduate scheme the year, involved in um, structured finance latterly um, and syndications um, between Edinburgh and Glasgow. And that got me interested in the investment side of things. And initially I went to 3i on secondment, loved it that much, the investment side of it, I ended up moving there um, and I worked there for around five years or so um, and then um, it was getting close to 3i starting to move out of the market that was becoming quite clear they started to move um, up the food chain much more into the, the private equity side rather than the, the small business side which is what I enjoyed in particular um, so I left there to do property lending for a little while but decided that wasn't really for me sorry um, and uh, it's got Enterprise was investment at that point, and for me that was a great balance between the investment side, work with companies that I really enjoyed, and the public sector, sort of giving something back and getting involved in the kind of greater good, as it were. So that, that caught my interest, and I've been uh, there ever since, doing what I'm doing. And what was it about working with the small companies and that side of it? What is it that you really enjoy about that? So um, for me it's the people. It's the um, the ideas and the interests that people have, and just the, the motivation that people have got behind their ideas and the passion and the vision, um, and you see that much more in investment equity than you do in um, kind of stable long-term businesses, where it's all very interesting in different ways, but it doesn't have that same kind of vision uh, round about it, and and the same people with the, with their interests and uh, entrepreneurship. Okay, and. Talking about the Scottish Investment Bank, can you just talk us through how it's op how it operates and how it's structured? Just to go through that in case people are not familiar. Yep. So um, the Scottish Investment Bank is the investment division of Scottish Enterprise, and hopefully most people know that Scottish Enterprise is uh, one of or the biggest. Uh, of the two enterprise agencies in Scotland. So, so SE's role is economic development, so trying to make Scotland a more competitive uh, country and try and you know, escalate our profits as a country. Uh, and what my team does is all the investment activities, all the commercial investment activity across the whole of Scotland, so also the Highlands and Islands area as well. It's obviously quite a specialist um, area, so rather than um, high doing their own, it makes sense for it all to be combined together to have that um, kind of economies of scale. So any commercial activity from an investment or lending point of view that the SD gets involved in, and my team are responsible for that. But the two, the main parts of, of our model and what we do is the financial readiness side, which is where we deal directly with companies that are looking to raise funding, both helping them navigate the landscape because we know it's, it's quite complicated, there's quite a lot of things out there, which is great, there's a lot of choice, but it can be quite difficult if you don't know where to look and, and um, what you're actually needing for your business. So that team works very close with the companies, help them navigate what's there, help them understand what's the right thing for them as a business and also helps them get ready for that. So whether it's business plan, pitching um, or just uh, introductions to different um, investors. The other main part that we do is our co-investment funds. So we operate three funds that are all co-investment funds, which means that we're led by the private sector. So we work very closely in partnership with the private sector. Uh, they're the ones that find the deals, so they want to do the deals and then bring them to us to, to invest alongside. And we then work with them throughout the, the kind of history of the, the company. And also 
Is there a typical size of equity investment that the SIB would tend to co-invest on? So Does it vary? We can invest from um, down to 20,000 up to, well, there's, no, there's no limit as such, but the funds that we operate um, are going to have an investment fund of 2 million there. Something I should say actually, you know, if, if anyone has a question, you don't need to wait till the end. So if you do want to ask a question on anything I'm asking, just put your put your hand up and I'll, I'll try and involve you. Um, but just going into that about value, um, how does SIB ensure, um, you know, value in terms of return? Because that's to be commercial investments. And in terms of what makes a proposition investable, what are, what are the types of things that you would look for and, and you know, what's attractive to investors? So I think first and foremost people. Um, investors invest in people they like, you know, pretty much. And I know some people kind of struggle with that concept, it must be about the mode, it must be about it, but actually it's not because uh, investors see lots and lots of propositions. I mean, some of them literally you know, hundreds come through the door. Um, so so what they, they, they read things and then they meet people you know, quite quickly and there needs to be that, that kind of synergy there. Because ultimately, you know, there are challenges ahead for any business and having an investor um, that kind of works closely with the, the company is you know, essentially important. And having that mutual respect um, there, I think, is, is really important for any business and any investor. Uh, so people definitely, I think a strong vision is really important too, uh, followed up by, by a strong strategy behind it. And investors are really looking for something that's disruptive or something that's going to really change things. That's where they're going to make the most money, something that's a step change in the market. There's a need for it to be scalable. You know, businesses that don't have that scale are not going to, uh, to be the really high growth opportunities which uh, you know, investors are looking to you know, achieve. And is it across all sectors? Yes, yeah, so there are two main funds, the investment venture fund, our sector agnostic. Um, so we will invest in any, any type of company that, that meets our criteria through those. We do have another fund called the Renewable Energy Investment Fund, which does what it says in the it's, it's focused on renewable energy. Um, we, we do, sometimes do other approaches, we invest in the Epidance Life Science Fund, so that's a third party fund for an investor. Um, and that was because Life Science in Scotland needed a boost, they need a local venture capital company, we supported that happening. But we do still invest in life sciences through our, our other funds. But what we try to do is to have a, a generalist approach to the all businesses over all sectors, all geographies, if they're in that criteria behind the particular company, are able to, to get funding from, from us. And how do you go about things like due diligence? Is that SIB take a role in that or would it be managed already by the investors that are going to be bringing pipeline? So mainly we don't and our plan is not to. Our, our approach is to, we have different funds operate differently. One of them, the co-investment fund, we diligence the, the investor that we're going to sign up as what we call the credited partner who brings deals to us. Through the venture fund we don't do that but we're still um, very mindful of who the, the co-investor is and our approach 
to the deal will be dependent on who the, the co-investor is. Um, we are, are seeking to be led by the private sector, so we really want them to have done the diligence and leadership moving on the back of that. We want to can rely on what they've done, but it will depend whether they've done any and um, when they did it, if they're invested already. There's various aspects to why we might need to take a different approach. But our first and foremost way to operate is to very much go on the back of what's done already and only to do diligence when it's required over and above what's there to, to limit the time and to limit the cost to the company, but obviously the risk for us and public sector funding have to be very cautious of that, so some things we do have to do. Mm -hmm. And at a, more, you know, a practical level, what type of involvement does SID have with the portfolio companies once you're going there? <coughs> So we never just mm -hmm. see ourselves directly and the, the main reason for that is quite simple. My portfolio manager have probably got 30 to 35 companies each and for those that, that know what comes to the board seat you'll know that that's just not really possible or um, desirable for, for them given that. Um, so we never take a board seat directly, so an investor director um, position but we do seek to appoint non exec directors to, to some of the companies we're invested in. So to support the companies getting the right skills around the table that they need to support their, their business and their growth, sometimes it's because we need um, somebody else into the, to the company to, to help us with maybe some challenge that we've got, um, so we will look to do that. We will always have an observer, right, um, and the managers do try to, to go along to, to go, it's not all of them, because again it's just not possible for there are that many companies to do that. But where there's a, a need or a challenge or um, just you know an infrequent basis, we'll go along just to see the board dynamics and get closer to the company and the people around the table. And it comes to the wider point and what we do to manage our companies. Again, uh, we look to be led by the, the co investors, the, the private sector investors in, in the companies, um, and very much rely on their input and their, their skills and their the connections um, around about that but we do get involved in, in other ways. So sometimes we're needed and they, and they want us at the, the board and want us to come and help with our, our connections, etc. Uh, but we particularly provide a route and a sort of route into the wider Swedish enterprise. So Swedish enterprise has a kit management service, as people might can know about, which is a direct support for companies on a growth trajectory with either leadership skills or strategy development or um, into international markets through our SDIs, which in, Development International, um, so we we provide that that other aspect to it as well to make sure that the companies are aware of what other support can be there, and including grant support and the like as well. And then obviously with the, the number of portfolio companies that you have, you're not going to know each of them at an individual level. But if you can maybe talk at a, maybe more of a trends level, what are some of the challenges that you might see, uh, you know, or impacting growth opportunities for companies in their portfolios? So there's obviously um, you know, quite a degree of uncertainty around at the moment on the, the kind of political side um, and that, that is causing some companies some concern, although I have to say not as much as I thought there might have been and I don't know whether that's a combination of um, just life's uncertain and there's always some uncertainty and therefore um, it's just one more thing or, and I, I think some of it's almost people getting a bit fed up of it, it's, it's sort of there all the time and, and it's difficult to work out you know, what's positive, what's negative and no doubt a lot of it will start to, to kind of cross itself out depending on what combination of outcomes happens. So I think some companies are just deciding, do you know what, that's, that's just kind of life and what will happen will happen and, and kind of focus uh, on the business. We do see uh, some sort of skills issues uh, particularly coming up and particularly on the kind of tech side of things. So as there's a, you know, a hub in Edinburgh, there's a lot of skills required and um, you know, the software side, and that's becoming you know, a bit of a challenge for some of our companies. Yes, and, and you know, in some ways that's good because it, you know, we can see you know, Scotland's a great place to, to encourage um, a lot of the individual right skills to, to come up and do. You've got you know, people up the road, down the road, and that kind of hub of activity is a good way to get people here. But I think it's kind of at that tipping point of um, it's just a real struggle to, you know, to get the right skills, and that's constraining growth in a lot of ways as well. Inward investment into Scotland. Have you seen any trends there? Yes, and uh, you might have seen the EY attractive survey was out yesterday, the day before. Um, Scotland came um, second again uh, to London and the South East, which is great. So our inward investment record uh, remains really strong. <coughs> and that's because people do see Scotland as a great place to, to work, to live. Um, see the skills, see the supportive business environment that's there, a very strong ecosystem. 
so that, that's great for us to be able to attract companies in. But there is growing concern though with um, Brexit and other things or, you know, the, in the background how much impact that's going to have and I certainly know our SDI team are working really hard at the moment in trying to, uh, to convince a lot of companies it's got remains, it's got a great place to come. So we've not seen that fall off yet um, and I'm certainly obviously hoping it doesn't but that, that's the risk for us and that becomes more and more challenging particularly as we get closer to, you know, to the outcomes. In terms of the um, financial readiness program, can you maybe give us some more examples of what types of things might be helpful to people that are you know, looking at setting up a business or growing a business for that? Yeah, so um, I guess a couple of things I would uh, I'd suggest um, that people need to have a, have a good think about. Um, it's really, so at the point I made earlier around um, investors and, and, and how they invest in companies and people that they like. I think the same works for companies looking for investment. Um, I think it's very important to find an investor that you like, that you trust, that you're comfortable with, because when you hit that um, kind of rocky patch in the road, then you, you need to know you've got a supporting investor that you can have a conversation with, <coughs> and you can tell your problems to, and you can kind of work through it together. Um, we spend a lot of time with companies supporting them on their funding strategy and making sure they have one, because mm -hmm. a lot of them don't. A lot of companies want to raise money today for the thing they want to do, um, and not actually think through the future. And that's really quite important. To have an exit. Uh, well, funding strategy and exit strategy, that would be my, my, my next part. Because on the funding side, you know, it's all very well raising money now for, for what you're looking to do, but the type of investment or, or funding that you get can have a big impact on the next round of investment that you might want to have. So if you take effective funding from the wrong, place, then you know, your next round you might not be able to get for what you're looking to do. You know, so things like crowdfunding are, are super for, for certain types of companies and for, and for certain uh, you know, growth trajectories, but for companies that are then looking for a different type of funding going forward, whether it's angel or VC funding, it might not have been the best thing to do to take crowdfunding first. And it's not, don't do that, and I'm not saying that for a second, it's about thinking through where are you going what's that funding strategy going to look like and I've seen some companies making sensible decisions about taking less funding now from a party that's the right party mm -hmm. than more funding from another party that actually isn't knowing that when that next round comes the round after that that's going to be a better place to be and the same on the, on the exit side companies really need to think about what that exit is going to look like uh, and primarily so that they can well, obviously focus on it and, and know that we're in the right direction for it but also so they're very clear on the value inflection points in the business. And um, we've sort of fortunately seen a number of companies that, that aren't focused enough on the exit strategy and they've kind of missed the value inflection point, which is sort of fine if, if you're going for something else. But if you miss it, you didn't realise you've missed it. And the next one is, you know, five, ten you know, years away, then, you know, you might regret that in due course. So having it set out um, is really important. And important for investors to know both what their future funding strategy is and also where that exit is going to come from. And things change and people are very aware of that, but it needs to be a key focus for the business so that um, they're always thinking about it going in that direction. And they shouldn't be worried about changing it, and it's, it's, it's fine. Investors don't have a, a massive issue with strategies changing as long as they're part of that and they know the reasons why they support change of direction. I think sometimes companies can fear um, kind of changing the strategy and thinking investors are going to be put off by that. And clearly they will be if it's, if it's a wrong thing to do, but if they can um, you know, get their head around it and understand the reasons for it, then they tend to be very supportive of it. And what about um, in terms, you mentioned earlier on about follow-on funding, what are the types of, I guess, milestones or achievements that investors want to see? So I guess they don't want to be funding the business as usual, is there, is there you know, things that they would look for? Yeah, so I think it probably depends on whether it's kind of tranched investment that's literally milestone related and, and obviously that the key for the milestones to, to be made. Um, and that is something we, we see quite a lot more in Scotland than, than other areas, um, that kind of tranched investment. Some people see it as drip feeding companies and that, that's a criticism that we sometimes get in Scotland. But um, that, that can be the case sometimes, but, but sometimes it is literally trying to focus management on direction of travel and all the milestones that they, that they need to achieve. Um, but for, for investors to follow on, and, and if you've got investment in deep pockets, 
then it's uh, obviously good to, to know that at the beginning so you know that you can, you can go back for more funding. If it's in line with direction <coughs> travel, if there's reasons for why things haven't been achieved that were set out, then again it's, it's fine as long as it's, it's clear. What investors don't like is where a company's always trying to get someone just never getting there. If you go back from when you've not achieved what you said set out to do, then you need to be able to explain why. And there's market issues, there's challenges, you know, that, that is part of life in a company, but some of them should be foreseen and some of them should be planned for. Occasionally things are, are neither. Um, and, and again, that's possible and acceptable. But the things that, that should be foreseen <coughs> then investors are, are really expecting that to happen and do then have concerns if, if companies are not meeting milestones and just not seeing uh, you know what could be happening in the corner not planning for it. So having a plan A and a plan B is usually very important. Question at the back there, Craig. Yeah, I've got a question about pitching. Um, I advise clients mostly in the food sector and in the life science sector. And I recognise that there is, uh, both both have difficulties, but in the food sector, for pitching to investors, and they bring along a sample of whatever it is they've got, so you get to try it. Um, it's quite easy for an investor to understand the market that they're in, because they say, We're, you know, we make a certain type of bread, this is the type of bread that's in the market. We can bring along competitor spreads. It's quite easy to get across what you're talking about to investors. In the life science industry, I find um, I feel sorry for some of my clients because they get in <coughs> science which can be really complicated, and of course, to understand across is quite often lost. Particularly if the person pitching is the the genius behind it and find it difficult to articulate. Do you have any hints or tips to help people that are in complex technologies and they want to try and? pitch it in a meaningful way to investors and maybe don't have that background. Yes, so um, my, my suggestion would be for anybody to be able to pitch their business to somebody that knows nothing about the sector within a minute and that's really, really difficult but the amount of time, I mean I sit in a lot of pitch panels and the like and if within you know a minute you really have no idea what the company's doing, you're not really going to, to get much after that. And I think it's a really big challenge for people who are the, the, the techies behind a company to be able to, to talk about it in a way that other people understand when it's obviously their area and they know it well. But it's, it's, it's incredibly important to be able to do that. And that's a skill in itself, I think, for anybody. So I think getting other people to help with that is, is probably the most important thing to do. Because if you are that, that kind of techie genius, you're unlikely to be able to yourself convert it into layman's language. <coughs> So I would definitely recommend that they bring in other people round about them to do that and to do a lot of practicing. Because one of the, the kind of suggestions that I would have for, for any company is that people should see themselves as pitching all the time. So it's, it's different people in different ways, but ultimately if you're trying to bring in um, customers or, or staff or non-execs or funding or whatever it is, you're pitching your business you know, to all those people and they perfecting your pitch. You can't start, I, mean, I have heard people say that you know, the elevator pitch is you know, the most important thing and so sort of nothing in a business planning you know, matters and I, and I certainly wouldn't go as far as that, but the, the, the pitch that you do, whether it's in your exec summary or you do yourself verbally, is incredibly important. So a lot of faces will say, as I mentioned, they get hundreds of business plans and they look at the exec summary and if they don't understand it, you know, it kind of goes in the bin. And that's unfortunate and, and very unfortunate for life science type companies and, and others that have kind of complex, you know, things behind it. But it's just, you know, a fact of, of life really that, that generally, there's obviously some specialist investors that, you know, fully understand it, but a lot of people who are speaking to won't. I, um, I remember one of my clients had a, a, a treatment for premature ejaculation, which <laughs> they went round two different VCs and the, it was clear that the, the VCs were just far too embarrassed to even contemplate the <laughs> potential benefit. And it's a very important market for, in the world. Um, and it has been picked up and it's doing very well. But I think literally the problem was that they couldn't explain the way that the other side wasn't um, too embarrassed that they were too embarrassed to actually listening mm -hmm. to the project. So um, they found a specialist um, a VC that had previously invested in some sort of um, sexually related products and was perhaps the final Would you, would you say that's related to doing your research on your investors before you? Yes. Absolutely. So, you know, not, not all types of investors are interested in all types of businesses, 
Um, and that's a point on your, your fund strategy, same, same idea, it's around the type of investors that are right for your business, whether it's special investors, whether it's corporates, you know, which is an important kind of market uh, these days as well, and trying to align what you're doing and, and your funding need with the type of investors. Now that can be incredibly difficult. You know, I've heard from people like Leslie Eccles at, at Fangio previously around speaking to, I think it was 90 different VCs before somebody sort of really got it and, and was interested. And unfortunately that is part of, of raising funding and it's why it takes, you know, a lot of time sometimes. How long does it take actually? Well, I mean, it, it, it can really depend. Um, and particularly the earlier stage I think can be more challenging. But then uh, I spoke to a company recently that was the first person we spoke to ended up investing their business. So, so, so it is, you know, how long's a bit of string, uh, you know, to a level. But um, it is it incredibly important to do that research. And it's one of the things that we as a third financial entity mentioned earlier, one of the things we're trying to do more of is to help companies with that. Because it can take it, you know, a massive amount of time. And the more we can do to have the connections and the contacts, we've got databases now that we use to work out who's investing where, to then start to home in in a bit more kind of clarity, a bit more granular detail as to the right investors to speak to. And then when should companies think about raising money? All the time. <laughs> that, is, that is one of my probably biggest frustrations, I have to say, um, with companies. Um, because we, we try and bring a lot of investors to Scotland to showcase Scotland what we've got to offer here. We go out to companies to say, right, we've got you know, so and so coming up, do you want to come and uh, you know, kind of pitch? Oh, we're not fundraising just now. It can be often the response that we get. And my response is, you're always fundraising until you've got to where you're going and you've got that exit, or you know, some people it's a lifestyle business, and that, that's when until you've got there, you're always fundraising. And I think you probably often hear people say that the easiest time to raise money is when you've got money. And it's incredibly true. Because if you if you if you really need your money now, then you, you can become quite desperate, um, either in your language or who you're approaching or where you go about it. Same with an exit, you know, for that matter as well, that when you've got no cash it's very difficult to, to negotiate a good exit. And get the terms that you want. Yes. And it's and it's absolutely the same the way in. So I think that's the same point on you're pitching all the time for your business in lots of different ways and you're fundraising all the time in lots of different ways. Uh, you just have to focus on that, I think, all the time. It should be every opportunity to go to a pitching event, to a networking event. Because it, even if you're pitching your, your business, um, you're not actually needing money now. And actually, that's quite nice if you're watching pitching events where they're not all looking for, for money now. Then you need to get in front of people who could be interested. And a lot of the VCs and even the later stage VCs will say they track companies for a long, long time. So we get a lot of later stage VCs coming to events like EIE, which is obviously you know, much earlier uh, stage. And, and they just want to know what's coming through, want to understand what's there, and, and some will take their eye, and they wouldn't be investing in it at that stage, but they just want to, to know what's there, and they'll monitor it for a long time, keep in touch with the company until it's right for them. I read recently about some VC funds starting to be put more into angel funds, or actually tracking and networking with angel funds. Is there a route for that sort of you know, networking and pipeline building? Yeah, so, so we did a piece of research a couple of years ago on angels and VCs working together. Um, and we tend to be worse at it than elsewhere in the UK. Um, we don't have enough angel VCs working together. Now some of that is because we've actually got a really strong angel um, network here and a lot of angel investment and a lot of angels are seeing the companies through to, to, the, to the end of the funding anyway. But there's also just you know, attention with some of the, the ways you know, both of them fund. Um, and that's one of the things that we want to work on to make sure more is happening. Um, and that we can play a role in that because we can co-invest with angels, we can co-invest with VCs, so we can kind of go between the two and help with that. And we've had a number of conversations with VCs around the role that they can have in helping um, early stage investors exit, which I think is often the right thing for the, the early stage angel investors. Mm -hmm. It does, exactly, to, to go back into hopefully Scottish companies again, which is what we, we want to see. <coughs> well, um, I've got one last question, but what I'll do is I'll share the floor first um, and I'll open up to any questions, Kevin. Um, taking you back to your co-investment model, um, as public sector, what lessons have you learned working alongside private sector in that investment Oh, no, that's a good question. Um, so, what lessons have we learned? So, private sector investors don't know everything, and we say we'd be one of them, um, and they're not all equal, would be the other thing. There's um, a lot of different um, models and a lot of different approaches out there. But um, I would certainly say that the investors that, that we see are very committed to um, supporting 
uh, the Scottish companies in the, the road trajectory, which is, you know, as I say, what we want to see. So we um, we work very close to the private sector. We, we, as I mentioned, want to be led by them, but we also know that we can't fully be led by them because ultimately they're there for commercial uh, returns, which we want to see too. But we're very much focused on the economics, and that's why we, you know, we do what we do. So it, we are in the main aligned with them, but we're not always fully aligned. So we need to work very closely to make sure they know what our objectives are and they know what we're trying to achieve at our investment as well. Um, what, what would you say kind of makes a startup look really appealing to an investor and at the early stages how much should you be prepared to give up to get an injection of cash? So um, I'll take them the latter question first. So um, when my other little frustration says, sorry what you said there about giving up, so you need sell your equity. But I think that there is a concern that people feel that they are giving, giving something up and that, that can cause kind of tensions with investors when, when they are obviously kind of purchasing it. But you know, ultimately it's about trying to get a balance right. So it's, you do see a lot of companies who don't want any external equity in their business because they want to own it all. Um, and you know, that's kind of you know, fine to a level, you know, obviously, but you know, as it, I'm sure you've heard people say you know, you'd rather have a smaller slice of something much bigger, which ultimately is what it's about. And I guess it's around trying to get the right investors in, you know, back to my kind of earlier point and trying to get that balance right. And, and investors want management teams to be motivated and obviously you know, the equity side is a big part of it. Um, so seeing, seeing commitment there, be it financial or time, is very important. But ensuring that you're aligned and that motivation is there, you know, for everybody. So you have to to maintain a meaningful equity stake, stake in a business, and um, for, for you to want to, to work as hard as um, investors want you to to work. So it's it's definitely balanced, and it depends again how many investors you look to bring into your business, and making sure that that balance works between everybody as well to make sure that you. You've got the investors aligned with each other as much as aligned with you. And so the first question was around what makes a startup attractive. Is that right? Yeah, because you might have low or no revenue <laughs> in your early stages. And so, what is it that makes it particularly appealing to get involved in startup? So I think it is that um, kind of excitement of it. So having something that's innovative <coughs> and different and groundbreaking. So I think when investors see that something could have just massive potential. I think one of the challenges, and back to the point earlier around, you know, a business model trying to explain it, that you know the investors need to understand the opportunity that's there, and, and whether it's technical or not, even that technical, just understanding the opportunity, um, because if they don't don't see it as being big, then it's, it's unlikely to catch their attention. But that needs to be balanced with the risks as well. Uh, I've spoke to a number of companies and read business plans where it's you know all these great opportunities, but nothing about the you know the risks that need to be balanced. And investors want to know that uh, you know companies understand it, yeah. and that they're focused on, on both sides of it. Uh, so, so there's no point trying to sort of you know hide the risk. It's about being upfront about it and being clear. But for a lot of investors, I think something just takes their their interest as well. You know, something I've just seen a lot of businesses, because uh, I can see invest invest in a totally different sector than they've ever done before. And when we're trying to track it to, to help companies find it quite difficult to understand, you know, why you invest in this when this is what you've done over here. But it's just because they like the people, you know, back to earlier point, and they just really quite like the idea and it's taking their interest. So it's a difficult one. Really helpful. Michael. Uh, Michael from Show. Um, where do you see Scottish Investment Bank in five, ten years' time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, from the point of view of what we're, we're doing just now, um, we have got a massive portfolio, as um, Elisa mentioned, and that's early stage cash hungry companies. And that's you know great that we we generated that in Scotland and helped the, these companies, but it's also a bit of a challenge for us as well because these companies do need to, uh, further funding to grow. That's always been the intention, and we're very aware that there is a, a bit of a glass ceiling in some ways for companies looking to raise that kind of Series A and above, and we need to start moving more towards helping companies with that angle. <coughs> so we set out in a very early stage market to try and you know, achieve a lot of investment happening in Scotland and, and we've done that. There's a lot happening, it's grown in the last couple of years and there's a massive amount there. 
but that's just not enough to have a lot of uh, companies funded at the kind of first or second round. We need to really start seeing more Series A and above happening. So I think our focus, certainly in the next, so in five years' time, I think we'll have uh, more focus on um, the, the Series A and above activity. It doesn't necessarily mean us investing, it might, but the kind of connections that we're talking about earlier, helping companies work out how to get that, that Series A is probably the biggest part of what we'll be doing. Moving up that funnel. Yeah. You said it's a ten million area. Is is that the CBZ money we use? Well, kind of two million above is a way that, that we look at that. So that where we see the biggest challenges right. starting to increase at the moment is the two and above. But five to ten is often the area that, that people uh, talk about in the market as an area that needs attention. Yes, right, right, great. Thank you. Well, you usually yeah. drop out at that point, or do you currently? No, those? we do. Um, so we can follow our money and, and do that and plan to do that, but it just becomes more challenging for us with 280 companies if they were all to raise quite a lot of money, then you know, we've all got so much ultimately. What um, set of circumstances would you drop out? So um, we, we haven't, we, I suppose we have dropped out of funding rounds, um, <laughs> sometimes because we don't believe in the company's future. Um, and there has been a couple of good circumstances where we've not had to invest because other investors just love it and, and, and come in and fund it uh, quite substantially. We're not getting um, extra diluted and uh, your big penalties for not investing. We would like to see our role as um, based much more in the early stage and allowing other investors to come in. But that dynamic is quite a difficult one in the market, in new investors' role. You know, effectively, if they come in, early investors haven't, uh, are, aren't able to fall their money, then they can often get uh, disadvantaged quite substantially, which is the problem with a lot of the early stage angel investors that we touched on earlier. So uh, we are, we're keen to try and play that role and not have to continue to fall necessarily when it, particularly when it's uh, bigger amounts, but that does get difficult for us not to do that. The ideal is that we do find a mechanism to allow that to happen without having such a, a, a big pull on, on the public purse, because we can be quite a substantial shareholder in a lot of the companies, and it's quite a financial uh, pull in us if the big funding rounds happen. We've got time for just a couple more, so uh, Craig. Yeah, and Kerry, you mentioned earlier there are some very clear skills challenges out there just now. How much does that come into your decision process when you're making your investment decisions? So, um, I, again, we're relying on the, the private sector investors mainly in the proposition that you bring to us. And so in the initial stages, we have a number of conversations about, about skills and and how that, how the skills within the, the um, organisation that the company or within the board are going to be looked at. So we, in the main, are looking to the private sector to be thinking about that rather than us having a lot of conversation initially. So we are asking them to ensure that they are, that they are focused on that and they've got a plan to do that. Um, and we want to um, use our contacts to, to support as well. So one of the things that we've got is uh, Global Scots, yeah. which uh, you've heard of if others have. It's one of the things that we all pay, which is our connection with various people across the world who have got connection with Scotland. They're called the Global Scots. We sign them up as that, and they're there to provide advice to, to companies. So sometimes we use that to allow people to look further afield to try and get the skills that they need as well. Okay, one more. Um, is there an accreditation process for private syndicates or the VC that works with you? Is there a list for that? Yeah, so um, the co-investment fund has a, that model is based on a creative partner model versus a venture fund which isn't. So the venture fund, um, first because that's slightly easier, and that through the venture fund we'll invest alongside any private sector investor. Um, Would that include well, French? Well, we can and we have done. We're, we're sort of moving slightly away from that at the moment, just because we want to focus, I mentioned earlier, more on the arm's length. Um, sophisticated investor side because that's where we're seeing the most benefit coming to our companies. But the model is designed to be very flexible to allow us to invest alongside to anybody looking to invest in the company. And our approach to that investment will depend who it is. So that could still be a very sophisticated VC um, and therefore our approach will be much more hands on to um, maybe an individual high net worth individual who's maybe not a sophisticated investor or where there are you know family and friends and founders which we have done previously at the same. 
but the co-investment fund is set up in a credited partner uh, we so we diligence the investor that wants to be a co-investment partner and that's looking at their history and the diligence process and everything else and then the, the investment process is very streamlined thereafter because we've, we've signed them up we're not looking at the investment proposition itself through that model where we expect the private sector to do that and our partners co-investment partners are all online on our website in no small and year and gives you a bit of detail about who they are and what they're interested in. So um, just a last question that we always finish on, what would be your top three pieces of advice, Kerry, for entrepreneurs to continue signing? So I've probably covered um, a lot of the things, but just to bring out maybe the ones that I would see as um, the most important. So I would reiterate again, and I've probably done it twice already, really, around the, the relationship with your investor. Uh, I do think that is the top priority for, for any company. I mean, the, the, the one thing I think we'd all know is that you, know, you, you look for funding, you put a business plan in, um, and it's not going to happen. Ultimately, you know, we all know it won't happen. And um, how much different to that it is is, you know, the, the big question. And there's going to be bumps along the road, you know, without without a doubt. And you have to have somebody that you can you can share that with and, and get through those difficult times. Um, if it's the first time you have a bump, you're all falling out. That's that's not going to kind of really work out. So spending the time to find the right investor, I think, is uh, probably the most important thing. Um, and you know that. The constant fundraising element, I would probably reiterate as well, that companies need to be focused on that all the time. Fundraising can take a huge amount of time, as mentioned earlier, it can be, be quick and easy, but I think that's probably the, the precious few that we see that the process has been quick and easy. Um, and trying to run a business and fundraise at the same time is probably one of the biggest challenges a lot of early stage companies um, kind of go through. And therefore, doing the groundwork on an, an investment proposition that might be coming is really important so thinking constantly about you're going to be fundraising at some point the more contacts you can make the more engagements you can make the more you can warm investors up so that when that fund round does come then you know a lot of that's done already i think is incredibly important and uh, i'd also one of the things i've probably not mentioned um is getting people round about you that you can really trust i think is really really important when you're, you're fundraising it's really difficult to run a business as well. You need to have you know, your, your management team around about you, your board, your non-executive your advisors, all people that you really can rely on um, along the way. I think, you know, just the entrepreneurs that uh, want to control everything and you know, think they're the only person that can kind of do it because it's their baby. Uh, but whilst it is their baby, you don't have to take that away by having people around about you. But you need to bring the skills in. I've often heard people say about you being better than yourself, which, which I agree with. I've done that in my own team with some fantastic people in there. And that's the best thing that you can ever do as you start to, to grow your business, to have that network around you and, and wider than that, your advisors and everybody else. So, so take, take the help you can get. I guess know your strengths, but know your gaps and how to fill those. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. that's, that's fantastic. I've learned a lot. Um, really interesting insights so thank you so much Kerry. Can you have a, a thank you?